Knights fans, it is finally here, the moment that we've all wanted, we've been waiting for, and hoping that this team specifically could get there, and they did it. The American Conference Championship this Saturday against a very tough opponent that we know very well. We've seen them this year, but listen, I have no idea what's going to happen. No earthly clue. You never want to see a team that's very good twice in a year. And because UCF, you know, lost the game to Navy and, you know, they beat USF, but you know, they beat USF. You don't get the game at home. So you have to travel back to Ullman Stadium in New Orleans to take on a tough Tulane team. That's kind of the Cinderella story of all college football this year. And I don't know if anybody wants to do that, but hello and welcome back to charge on the American Conference Championship Edition. I am your host, Sean Green. And today, we welcome Rob Husby. Rob, you know, it's been a little bit. Uh, if you saw our last show, I was by myself because I recorded like five different episodes with Nick and they all they all got lost. They all were gone. I think they just didn't want to hear all the negative stuff that we were saying. Um, but listen... Our fans are definitely going to get a long episode today, um, but how are you doing? How are you feeling after that uh, that win uh, in Tampa on last week? Last week, yeah. I mean, that was certainly a win that you kind of question, and you're like, man, was that really a win, or was that just UCF getting by it by the skin of their teeth? I mean, that was not a satisfying win, and I don't think anybody. Uh, from UCF's perspective, was satisfied with that win. I mean, to blow like almost a four touchdown lead. Uh, to USF, a, a you know a team that has one win all season, is pretty embarrassing um, to say the least. And I know a lot of people are now you know kind of questioning UCF. You know, does this team really you know deserve to be in a championship game? I mean, they they've certainly battled all year. They've beaten the teams they need to beat, but they've come up short against bad teams. You know, they've come up short against teams they should be beating, like Louisville, like Navy. Um, even like ECU, even though ECU has been a little bit more challenging this season. I mean, those are teams you have to beat. So when you struggle against those teams and you, even in a win, you struggle and it comes down to, you know, an amazing catch by Alec Holler against USF. I, I mean, you do, you can't help but go into this week feeling, you know, a little bit of trepidation and saying, okay, wh where are we with this program? Where are we with this team? Because this is what we've said all season is this team is a toss up. Week in and week out, you do not know what you're getting. Um, I think the confidence in this team should stem that, you know, they have beaten Tulane before. They've gone to Tulane and beat them while Tulane was ranked higher than UCF. And I think that's something that UCF should, you know, um, kind of be proud of. And and they can do that again. It's going to be hard, but I think there should be some confidence that UCF can go back there, bring a good traveling crowd, if not an even better traveling crowd for a championship game, and, and really... Um, you know, force some issues on Tulane and, and get another victory up in New Orleans. Guys, this episode of Charge On is brought to you by Bet Online. Guys, basketball is back, and Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. And as your continued source for all sports wagering information, Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and giveaways all season long. Always the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports and events, whether that's college football, NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even golf. Head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use promo code BELIEVE to receive your rewards. That's B-L-E-A-V to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. We're here, right? You had an interesting game last week. I mean... You, 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 the game was supposed to be over in the first half, but it wasn't. You let him come back. You know, JRP gets hurt. We don't know his status. We are assuming that he's going to play on Saturday, but we don't know. We Gus Malzahn, if we've learned anything this off this season, it is you will find out the quarterback on Saturday at kickoff. That's when you're going to find out who the quarterback is. But goes out, Mikey comes in, and listen, I said we. I, I gave you know, our team, I think a good amount of flack. And I think most UCF fans are now going into the championship game kind of eerie, kind of not as confident as you would be if you go out and blow out USF, right? Because if you go out and blow USF out, not saying it's a quality win, right? But it's, 
you're getting that tune-up game. You're at, you're firing on all cylinders. You're ready to go to face a two-lane team. That is just, it, let's be real here. They haven't had a lot of success in their program's history. I mean, you have to go back however many years they were in the SEC. Their, their, their program has struggled, right? This is a Cinderella season for Tulane. USF has been at the top of the mountain for the last however many years. Not saying, now listen, you, it's been a couple of years since UCF's been in an American championship, right? So we've been waiting a while to get back here. But at the end of the day, if UCF wins this conference championship game, it'll be five championships in the last 10 years. That is, that is, if that doesn't tell you UCF has been at the top of the peak of whatever college football mark you want to put it, they have been. But UCF, Rob, it's been this, we've said it, It's if anything comes from this season or whatever we name this season after, right, we're going to call it the roller coaster season. This And we've said this team can be great. They can, but they're good right now. Probably, most likely, because they are a roller coaster. You never know what you're going to get each week, right? I think last game signified that. The first half, you got the best version of UCF you can get. The second half, you get the worst version. That, If anything, it's almost poetic that that was the game against UC, USF. It epitomized the entire season in one game. But now, Rob, you get to you have to go to Tulane. You don't get it at home. You have to go to Tulane to win a conference championship, to play in a Cotton Bowl. It's everything that Gus Malzahn, his staff, have been, have been preaching since they technically got here. Um, so before we get into you know, breaking down the teams and breaking down the matchup and all that good stuff. How impressive is it? And I I don't, I think fans take it for granted because UCF has been at the top of the mountain for so long, but how impressive is it? And I get, I know Josh Heupel did it, but very different scenario, right? He was inheriting an undefeated team. How impressive is it that Gus Malzahn in his second year, he won nine games his first year and beat a Florida SEC team. And in his second year has beat two rank opponents and is now going to the American Conference title game in the last year that you are in the American when everybody is giving you your best shot. Everybody wants to beat you on your way out. And Gus Malzahn, though it's been bumpy, he's led this team and I think has really showed why he is UCF's coach for the very near and long future. Yeah, no, I mean, it's super impressive. I mean, this is everything Gus Malzahn promised when he got here. He said he was going to build a winning program. He's built a winning program. I mean, again, they've had their ups and downs this season. They had, you know, their ups and downs last season. But I think one thing is for sure is that Gus has built, you know, somewhat has somewhat rebuilt that winning culture that UCF was accustomed to under Scott Frost and in the first couple of seasons under Josh Heupel. Um, This is what Gus Malzahn promised and he's building something here. You know, he's built a lot of it from transfers. Uh, There's been a lot of transfers um, that have come to UCF just because of Gus Malzahn. Uh, We're finally going to get to see his, his recruitment at full strength next season uh, when UCF goes into the big 12. But no, I mean, you see what, what a coach that, you know, has been there before that has won uh, a championship that has won an SEC championship. That's won a college football championship. Um, you see the experience and the value that having a big name coach like that can bring a program like UCF. I mean, uh, there's an argument to be made that without the arrival of Terry Mohajer and Gus Malzahn ahead of last season, uh, it's, it's arguable that UCF isn't in the big 12 this quickly. Um, they've really, they've helped pioneer this new era of UCF and regardless of how, you know, this season ends and future seasons ends, um, I think he has to be remembered for what he started here. Um, this journey into the big 12, this journey into UCF, getting four star recruits and us being not satisfied anymore with low three star mid three star recruits. You know, now we expect these transfers, these four star recruits, um, to come under Gus Malzahn. So I think if anything, you know, regardless of Gus's play calling, his, you know, his decisions regarding the team, quarterback controversies, whatever, under Gus Malzahn, I think one thing you can say is that he is trying to reinstate that winning culture and he's done a very good job of making UCF a competitor again. Yeah, and I think that's ultimately, to be completely honest, again, in some of the concerns and some of the frustrations that UCF fans have are validated. They're valid. They're not validated. They are valid. 
I mean, play calling at certain points, some of the decision making. I think, yes, UCF fans have a right to those concerns. But at the end of the day, listen, you can look at Cincinnati, right? And you can have a coach that's a great coach and leaves. And UCF for years has dealt with that. You had Scott Frost, right? He built the program up in a couple years and then left, right? You get Josh Heupel. And though a, pretty much every UCF fan wanted Josh Heupel to leave. that It was a chorus of, we don't like Josh Heupel. Well, guess what? He leaves. He, get, he takes the Tennessee job, and he's being very successful at Tennessee. So UCF finally gets a coach under Gus Mazan who... Let's be real here. We can complain and we can moan and we can say all the things we say when you lose to a team like Navy or you lose your second game to Louisville. But at the end of the day, you're ranked 22 in the country. The college football committee clearly, clearly respects your head coach and what he's doing for your program. And you're going on to the Big 12 with your best recruiting class in program history. Who knows what the transfer portal is going to bring in the next week? I mean... I'm assuming that's going to be a huge day for UCF and just the amount of recruits that they're going to bring in up through the transfer portal alone. So I think the good thing is win or lose this American championship. I think UCF can be happy and proud of where they are and know, listen, you have to improve, right? This won't cut it in the Big 12. But I think Gus Malzahn, he hasn't got his full roster. He This is still part, mostly a roster that he inherited. Give him time. And he's showing even in just one year, or technically two years, but in a couple years, what he can do for this team. So we're starting off with that. I think that is a great starting off point to be very positive before we go into this. I mean, we can be positive. Listen, you beat Tulane, Rob, right? We we played them a couple weeks ago, beat them on their home turf, and really early on in the game, just dominated. Dominated Tulane physically. Um, forced turnovers, scored a bunch of points. JRP ran all over Tulane. And I think, listen, they were up 24 to 7, ended up winning 38 to 31. So I think when I'm looking at this game, the thing that scares me the most is number one, the fact that at the end of the day, we only put up 14 more points after that that point, and they put up, I mean, 24. That is that is significant. I mean, 24 to 14 after that point is a significant margin. And I think also the fact of the matter is Tulane is playing some of their best football right now. I think after they lost to us, they played SMU and Cincy. And both of those teams, and I think I said it on the show, Tulane had a harder schedule to end the season. We said, listen, they got to play us, play SMU, and play Cincy at Cincy. That's a tough gauntlet. They beat SMU 59-24, to 24, wasn't even a game, and they went to Cincy and ended their home winning streak. I, I think that is a very dangerous team. That is a very dangerous team in the sense that you've already played them and you've beat them, and you've proven that you can beat them. But let me ask you this. How dangerous is it, number one, to have a Cinderella team that's having a Cinderella-type season, going from 2-10 and 10 to 10-2, and 2, but also a team that is playing on their home turf in the American Championship, who is having that Cinderella season, but also a team that has a sour taste in their mouth from you beating them just a couple weeks back. Yeah, when I think what more to that point is that this Tulane team has seen what UCF can throw at them. You know, losing only by a touchdown to UCF, now they know what UCF's game plan is when they play a team like Tulane, and that's where it's going to force UCF's hand and Gus Malzahn's hand to completely change the game plan for this week. Because, right, what was the game plan against Tulane the first matchup? It was run all over them. They can't stop the run. They can't stop a running quarterback like JRP. Well, God forbid you don't have JRP this week. Well, now what's the game plan? You're going to be throwing a lot more because you have Mikey Keene, but also is it going to be a run-first offense, which is what UCF's bread and butter has been all season, is a run-first offense with, you know, and then when you put Mikey in there, you have, you know, some big passing plays and some big throws from him. But mainly it is still a run first offense. So I think what's even more concerning is that Tulane has seen this team before. And now Tulane and Willie Fritz know how to prepare for UCF. And it's up to UCF now 
to sort of counteract that and throw another curveball towards them and see if they can stop them. You know, hey, maybe the run game will work again. Maybe a running quarterback, if JRP starts, maybe that will affect them again. Maybe they just won't be able to stop it. But a good coach, which Willie Fritz is, and a good program, which Tulane is this season, I think they'll be able to adjust a little bit more. And that's what's got me a little bit more concerned. It's one thing to go on the road and go and win you know, on someone's home turf during this, you know, regular season, but you go into a championship game, you're going back to their home turf. I mean, it, it's not lightning in a bottle, but you gotta, you gotta get lucky twice that you beat them twice on home turf. Cause that's a hard thing to do, especially against a really good team like Tulane. I mean, they're a very well-rounded I, team, a well-coached team. Yeah. And I think that's what was kind of scary, right? Well, like I think we, listen, I think we've been very accurate on the show for most of the season. I said, I didn't fear Cincy right? I feared Tulane, and I also feared having to go to Tulane. Now, the atmosphere at Yeoman Stadium a couple weeks ago wasn't really nearly as what we assumed. We thought it was going to be sold out. Um, Our fans traveled very well. They said it felt like a UCF home game. I'm going to be honest, Rob. I know our fans are going to travel well. Tickets are sold out. It's going to be a packed house. You are getting a different atmosphere this time than you were a couple weeks ago, and granted, you should. It's a championship game. It's a championship. It should be a championship level crowd. And I don't know. I assume a lot of UCF fans are going to travel. It is in New Orleans. They did it last time. But how much will home field matter this time? Because I think a lot was made in the previous matchup where it was a toss up game. But everybody was saying, listen, if you're going to pick a team, pick Tulane. They're at home. How much is home field mattering this time, specifically with the difference in crowd? Now, you might get a lot of UCF fans going, but. How much difference is going is that going to play, especially uh, playing a second time up in New Orleans? Yeah, I mean, if if Tulane fans show out in full force and you know kind of drown out some of that UCF noise, you know that absolutely motivates the players. That absolutely motivates the entire Tulane team. You know, if they have most of the home crowd on their side and they're loud, which is what a championship game at home should be. Um, we've seen it at UCF. You know, when UCF and uh, the bounce house is at its loudest. You know, we know what can happen. Other teams have talked about it. Other quarterbacks have talked about it. They're like, it's deafening. We can't hear in there. The whole place is shaken. The fans are loud. It's hard to focus. It's hard to run plays off. And, you know, that's when you would start to see, especially under the Hypel era and Frost era, if you want to call them eras, they weren't that long. But, you know, under under those regimes, you know, uh, under those regimes, you saw teams take bad penalties and delay a game penalties because they can't hear their sidelines. So obviously, you know, if Tulane shows out in full force with this being a sold out game and make it loud, you know, it can absolutely be distracting for UCF. But at the same time, you know, if UCF travels really well and it's kind of a 50-50 crowd, you know, that can also affect it too because, you know, that gets in the players' heads a little bit if, you know, they're hearing UCF chants and they kind of have to drown that out a little bit because they want to hear from their home fans. So I think it's maybe a little bit less of a factor right now, but it could be more of a factor for Tulane this time around, you know, should their fans show up in full force for a championship game. Yeah. And here's the thing. Let's, let's talk Willie Fritz. Cause I think the one thing that I know, I I know about this Tulane team is I don't think they get too high or too low or get flustered too easily. I think this is, it, it goes from the top down. So you have Willie Fritz who we've, we talked about prior on the preview pod for the Tulane first game. And there were a lot of rumors, right? There was a lot of reports coming out that he was taking the Georgia Tech job. And we, as you know, we were texting and I was, you know, again, you don't ever want to see a coach leave a program except when it comes to Cincinnati. But Tulane was having such a great year and you kind of figured Willie Fritz would be in line for some job if he were to take it. And I was kind of excited. I'm like, listen, that's going to help. He's going to take the Georgia Tech job. He will not be coaching Saturday. And that might get in the minds of some players. I mean, it didn't for UCF when Scott Frost took the job and we were in the conference title game. And it was reported hours before the game that he had taken the job. And UCF found a way to win that game. But it still messed with the players. There was still, like, you could tell that they played their, their best game they could. But... Whenever you're a player and you go to a program and you have reports that your coach is leaving, that can mess up a player's kind of, you know, mindset. Well, they kind of put those rumors to bed very quickly in the span of a couple days. I don't know what was what transpired. I have a pretty good idea. I think he was going to take the job. 
but he said, I want to coach in the conference title game. And they said, no, we need you to recruit. The transfer portal opens up on December 5th. And cr- to credit to Willie Fritz, I think he said, well, listen, it's either I coach in the conference title game or, you know, I'm not going to take it. Now, this, I have no sources on this. I have, I have done little to, or, you know, I didn't even say little, no reporting on this. <laughs> but <laughs> I think just the way it played out, it seems like all the reports were he was taking this job. And then the next day, he's not taking it. And he's staying at Tulane. So that's kind of my thought process. And and I think that credit to him for just saying, listen, I'm not going to leave these kids. This is a huge game. Um, but I think it also, Rob, it even makes me more scared for UCF, right? Because those players, your coach is now staying. You're pumped up he's staying, that he chose to stay with you instead of taking a bigger job that was probably going to pay him a lot more money. And they have everything to play for, just like us. But... I think that adds a little bit extra boost. I, I mean, again, if Willie Fritz left and said, listen, guys, I'm, I take this job, I'm going. Not saying they wouldn't play well, but I think that would definitely mess with them a little bit. I mean, not having your leader there for your conference championship game who's been there all year. Now, not just that he's staying, he re, he's, he's staying for good. He's not taking another job. So I don't know. I think that really can affect UCF and just... Because I just think Tulane, not saying that UCF won't come out juice, but I think that adds an extra layer of juice if I'm Tulane. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you see the opposite effect with Cincinnati where, you know, Luke Fickle is all but guaranteed to take the Wisconsin job and you already start seeing players starting to decommit that that Fickle has recruited that are Fickle players and, you know, he's now uh leaving so you start to see these players decommit so there's the opposite effect too when a guy decides to stay i mean it, i think it shows the players that willie fritz has recruited shows the guys he's coached that hey i'm committed to regardless of what the circumstances are what it at least shows is that he's committed to the program right now and he wants to see this program through and he wants to see them win i mean from again two and ten season to a ten and two season i mean that's a huge turnaround in a year I, I think there's some pride with that that comes from the players and for Willie Fritz. I mean, they have a lot to play for now because their coach is deciding to stay and coach this championship game. Of course, they're going to want to win it for them. They're saying, hey, coach, you're committed to us. We're committed to you. We're going to see this through. This has been a passion project all season long. You know, you've said it before. It's a Cinderella story. Let's see it through. Let's Let's finish this out by winning a championship. So I think absolutely that can fire up the players and it, it, as well as it should. And I and again, that's, I mean, their goal all season was conference. I mean, I guess that's every program, right? But when you're two and 10, I don't know many players that are like, we can win a conference title and actually mean it. But this Tulane team, they came out and said, we're going to win a conference title. And Everybody laughed at them, and now nobody's laughing. Like, they are the favorite going into this title game. UCF is the underdog. Now, I think I'd rather have UCF be the underdog, because clearly when they're the underdog, they play their best games. (laughs) So, but I do think it is extremely dangerous. And if I'm being honest, after watching Tulane Cincy, I said on this pod, I would much rather play Tulane in New Orleans than have to travel and play Cincy in Cincy, even though I think Cincy would be the easier game. And I changed my mind really quick after watching that Tulane Cincy game. I said, nope, I want to go play Cincy at home. We'll go to Cincy, even though they're hard to play. And even though that would be a tough atmosphere, I surprisingly, I said, I'd rather have Ben Bryant because Evan Prater doesn't look like that. He's not him. I don't think, I mean, just watching him true freshman, and you started him in the game to bring you to the conference title. I get it. Ben Bryant is out for the year. But there was always those rumors that Cincinnati wanted Evan Prater. That was the guy they wanted to play. It was the same thing. Like, they were going... It was the same thing we've had to deal with, right, with Mikey and JRP. They wanted Evan Prater. Some guys wanted him. Some guys wanted Ben Bryant. It was that constant back and forth. Tulane made him look average. Extremely average. I mean... The one positive he did was running the football. He did not look accurate throwing. And I think that hurt Cincinnati. I mean, on now, I mean, the last throw where the receiver dropped it, that wasn't on him. But I think on need to have it plays, I don't think since he had it. And Tulane 
was just gritty and fought it out. And I mean, I think the, the thing we know is I think the two best teams in the American. You don't usually say that, especially when you're in this type of, you know, I mean, it could have gone very differently. I mean, hell, Houston could have been in the American Championship and we would have been flabbergasted, right? But I think these are clearly the two best teams you've got in the American this season, bar none. And I think it'll be interesting. Let's talk um, about the last matchup a little bit and kind of we can also get into what the teams are going to do differently because you mentioned it. And I think it's very important when you're seeing a, a team a second time, you're going to be doing things a lot differently or trying to stop things that the other team was successful doing in the previous matchup. So 38 to 31, UCF won. JRP threw 132 yards and a touchdown and ran it. 18 carries, 176 yards, and two touchdowns. UCF as a team had 336 total rushing yards. They ran the ball all over Tulane. Ultimately, that's what won them the game. If you go to especially that last kind of drive, I think UCF was up 31 to 24. I'm trying to remember back to the game. 31-24, and UCF goes on an eight-minute drive and just pounds the ball into their throat puts it in the end zone with a couple minutes left. Tulane would then go and score, but we got the ball back. There was basically no time, and we put the game away. Tulane, and this is what's also scary, Rob. Tulane got down early. Michael Pratt threw the most passes he's thrown all year against us. Reason being, because they got down early. Uh, Tajay Spears only had eight carries for 130 yards. He was clearly banged up a little bit in the previous in the matchup uh, earlier in the year. So he wasn't out there consistently. Now, they do like to run a bunch of different guys. But you take Spears out of that, and they only had 25 rushing yards besides Spears, right? Uh, so that's kind of the concern is Spears had 130 yards. They had 155 yards altogether. And he wasn't even healthy. Now, since he did a great job against him, uh, he had he had 35 carries for 181 yards. I get it's a lot, but I mean, for we had he had eight carries against us for 130 yards. So I mean, I would take 35 for 181 and two touchdowns. So here's the thing. Let's let's get into the minds, Rob. All right, let's get into the minds of UCF and Tulane. We know ultimately what each team wants to do right? We know UCF is going to want to run the football down our throats. We also know that JRP killed us in the run game. So here's the fear. The fear is Tulane's going to basically do everything they can to stop JRP from beating them with his legs. We've seen teams that have been successful with that this year. I mean, a good example is Louisville. I think they did a very good job. Now, granted, it was early in the year, but I think they did a very good job of kind of limiting JRP to short runs, not really letting him break off for anything. And Tulane in the second half really limited JRP to not a lot. I think it was 20, 30 yards in the second half rushing. So what if you're Tulane, Rob, what if you're Willie Fritz and you are game planning for UCF this week, what are you telling your defense and what are we looking at on offense to kind of get at the weaknesses of this UCF team and try and exploit them so that you can ultimately change what happened a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, you have to play more like that second half that Tulane did against JRP. You got to shut him down for making those big runs, like you said. Um, you have to take away his lanes. You know, it's a very, it's a very important game for the linebackers and for uh, the defensive line of Tulane to blitz a quarterback because – We've seen, we've seen it this season. If you shut down JRP's ability to run, which isn't, you know, all that easy. He is very crafty. He's a very gifted runner when it comes to, you know, running the football. But if you can force him into, into really scrambling and forcing to throw, he's going to make bad throws. You know, we, we know his arm isn't the best and not the most accurate. So if you take away his run game, you take away 75% of what he brings to the table. So I think if you're Tulane, you just have to, you have to shut him down. I mean, again, easier said than done, but all eyes have to be on shutting him down. Um, you know, then you have the UCF run game to worry about. But if you take the quarterback out of it and you force, you know, we've seen what happens when he gets forced into bad throws. He throws the ball, you know, uh, he makes bad decisions. He's, you know, he kind of, he doesn't really have an elite football IQ, so he doesn't really know to, you know, throw it sometimes when he's on the run. He'll sometimes wait too long. He'll throw 
you know, to a non-open receiver. We see what can happen with him. So I think that's what happens with Tulane is they really, really need to focus on getting uh, JRP to shut down the run. And so if you shut that down, I think it makes it a very difficult time for UCF. And that's when you start talking about, okay, at what point do we put Mikey in if, you know, JRP's just got nothing going? Yeah, and here's the thing. And I'm gonna, I don't think we see Mikey. I don't think even how – however bad the game is going, I don't think we see Mikey. Uh, just strictly, you know, we saw what he could do against Tulane, what JRP could do specifically. And listen, you did beat them before with him. And he didn't have a bad game through the air. I mean, 17 of 30 for 132 is not – it doesn't jump off the page, but he did what needed to be done. Now, here's kind of my – how I'm viewing this game a little bit. And I'm not giving a prediction. I'm just looking at strictly kind of what hurt Tulane and how I think this game is going to kind of play out. Time of possession. That's something that Tulane really, they like running the football. I said, they got down so far behind that they had to throw the football against us. And it ended up working. I mean, they got back in the game. They put up 24 points when they had seven and they were down by a lot, right? Here's the difference in the last game. And this is the difference of the game. Turnovers, Tulane had two. We had none. Time of possession, we possessed the ball for 35 minutes. Tulane did for 24. Those are the two differences. If you can run the football effectively, you waste a bunch of time off the clock. And I think that's what we said, right? We were talking, especially in the Navy game. We said, listen, that's what they're going to want to do. They're going to want to limit your possessions. They're going to run it down your throat. And they're going to make sure that they, when they have those scoring opportunities, they do that so they can shorten the game. I think Tulane's going to say, listen, we know UCF likes to score in bunches. We know they like to score quick. We are going to try, and as soon as when we get the ball, Tajay Spears, I have a feeling, is going to get the ball at least 30, 35 times. You're going to see a lot of Tajay Spears. And I'm going to be honest, UCF did not do a very good job against him in the first matchup. Again, eight carries for 130 yards. Now, we can talk kind of about how UCF will counter that because, again, they did have so many problems with him in the first matchup. But I think this is going to be a time of possession battle, like it usually is. But both teams, I think, are going to try to possess the ball for long periods of time. You might not see a high-scoring game like the first matchup. I kind of see it being more of a low-scoring, get-punched-in-the-mouth type of game. Um, But let's talk about... I'm going to... Let's talk about how what UCF needs to do to kind of change it up and kind of what I think they're going to do, right, Rob? Specifically, geez, specifically with Tajay Spears, I think you need to set the edge, especially on the defensive line. Um, Michael Pratt has been very good the entire season, but specifically the last couple of weeks at running the football. Against SMU, he had three rushing touchdowns. Uh, and 70 yards along with that. He also had three passing touchdowns. He only passed the ball 14 times against SMU and 22 times against Cincinnati. If that tells you, and they beat Cincinnati, right? He only threw the ball 22 times. He was 13 of 22, and they rushed the ball like crazy. They had, how many rushing yards did they have? I thought I wrote that down. They had uh, 221 rushing yards against Cincy. It doesn't blow off the page, but, I mean, if you're going for 221 against, a, at that point, a top 25 team, most likely you're going to win the game. I think if you set the edge and you can really force this two-lane team to just throw it, if Michael Pratt's throwing the ball 40 times in a game, I think for the most part, you're going to come out on top. I think UCF would have a very good shot. But if it becomes a time of, possess- a time of possession battle and Tajay Spears is just running it down your throat and Michael Pratt is killing you with you know the reads that he can take when he runs... It's going to be a long night for UCF because I just saw what Byron Brown did to you on Saturday with those same type of raids with Brian Batie and Byron Brown with the quarterback runs and the taking the run, the uh, running back takes to the outside that hurts UCF. And I think Tulane's going to do a lot of that. And I think ultimately that might be a huge issue for UCF. But again, we're talking about what they can change. And I think just as much as Tulane, Rob, can take away the JRP run as much as they want. We can run the ball, but UCF, I think, is going to say, listen, we're not going to let Spears beat us 
at the end of the day, we're going to make Michael Pratt throw four touchdowns to beat us. That's and and I think that has to be what Travis Williams is thinking, especially after the defensive performance they had last week. Yeah, absolutely, and I think you need to, especially against a mobile quarterback. You know, UCF's defense has struggles against motor, mobile quarterbacks, and you know Michael Th- Pratt's kind of a, a dual threat at that. He's a very good runner. He's he knows how to read, you know, uh, read openings and read routes and stuff like that. So he's very good with his feet. He's great at scrambling, um, and he's got a decent arm. So I think. No, like you said, if you can kind of take the mobile aspect away from them, which has kind of been a struggle for UCF's defense, I think you absolutely can't beat them in the air. But it's it's getting to the quarterback and making him, you know, not run as much out of the pocket is where it becomes an issue because that's what UCF has struggled with all season. So, no, I mean, you absolutely can't beat this quarterback. You just need to force him to throw a lot more than he does run because he can do both pretty, pretty well. And here's the, uh, you know, I think a lot of UCF fans forget this. And as I was doing my notes and researching for the game, I, I immediately remembered because it was such a huge talking point going into the game. UCF didn't have Devon Wilson or Jeremiah Jean Baptiste for that game against Tulane the first time. It's two of your defensive stars. And I think that will definitely play into game planning a little bit. I think, now listen, I think you definitely have to have a quarterback spy. Uh, I think that's, very going to be very important, but I think getting those guys back, especially in the run game, is going to play a huge factor. Uh, I think part of the reason why Spears kind of killed us on the outside is lack of communication. There were new guys in there. I think that was the first game Quadric Bullard didn't play because that he got hurt in the Memphis game. I think there was a lack of communication uh, with the safeties and the linebackers on you know what is what's the play. Where do I need to go? Where's the spot I need to be on the defense? And I think having those guys for this matchup is going to be huge for Travis Williams. And listen, they need a bounce back week. Last week was a piss poor effort in the second half. They played an outstanding first half and they they made plays when they needed to. But like I said, at the end of the day, UCF, if USF changed the play calls on that one three and out drive at the end of the game, UCF most likely is has a loss, another loss in their uh, loss column, but they don't. They ultimately won that game and, you know, credit to the guys for making the plays, but those guys are going to be huge coming back. Um, Offensively, I mean, listen, we've talked about it, right? I think to win this game, JRP needs to have another big game running the football, right? I think that is, Tulane has struggled with that aspect of their season is mobile quarterbacks, and JRP showed that. I think JRP, frankly, I don't think there's much that Tulane can do. I mean, you can you could send as many guys as you want. I think Tulane might blitz a lot more this game than they did in the last matchup. Uh, and they'll send a lot more guys at him. But I think if JRP plays the game he did last time, I think we, we win. I think it's not even close. Uh, I think we are the better team. But... Make no mistake, I mean, this Tulane defense is legit. They are a top 20 defense in college football. And again, the sour taste in their mouth, that plays a huge factor. I mean, UCF put up 38 points on you last time, and this quarterback ran for 176. So, and he would have ran for 300 last week if he didn't get hurt. But that kind of leads me into my next point, Rob, okay? JRP didn't play the whole second half. I mean... He pulled the hamstring. Gus has said it's been happening. For, it's been he's been dealing with it for a month, and at that point, he he would have played Tulane with this injury, right? But you're in the American Conference Championship, the AAC Championship, and to win, you're going to have to run the football, and you're going to have to do a lot of RPOs. You're going to have to know when to pull the ball and run, which I think that is JRP's biggest strength is he knows when to pull that ball and to run it himself. I mean, he's been very successful with that. But how big of an injury, how impactful, if he's been nursing this thing for a month, how impactful is it going to be on Saturday when, listen, the other team knows you're banged up, you've been banged up, you probably aren't practicing the way that you need to practice. I mean, I don't know how much these players are practicing like hard-wise. I mean, I think they're probably going pretty light for most of the week, but I don't know if JRP's running until Saturday. That's like our, so how, how crucial do you think that is for UCF? And yeah, like 
I don't personally think Mike Keene will see the field. I think they're going to go with JRP regardless. But, I mean, it must have been pretty serious to where they don't play him in the second half of USF when they're coming back and, and trying to take the win, too. Yeah, and I think that's where they come in with a little bit more you know, confidence in Mikey and saying, Hey, we know Mikey can get it done. You know, maybe it's taking USF a little bit lightly, even though clearly they shouldn't have. Um, but I think they knew that pulling JRP, you know, there's a very good chance that UCF gets into the championship game because they were up by so much, um, regardless of how the outcome was. But I think there was confidence enough to say, Hey, listen, JRP is not a hundred percent. We're probably going to make the championship game. Let's pull them and see what happens. You know, Mikey, we, we've seen Mikey be able to close out games, lead comebacks. Let's let's put it in his hands and see what he can do and finish this out uh, and kind of have to live and die by Mikey at that point. Um, but I mean, UCF comes out better if, you know, that absolutely helps JRP. Um, so, no, I mean, it's all about getting him prepared for, you know, Saturday. He needs to be at full health. Uh, Tulane knows that if you blitz the quarterback a lot and the guy can't run very well because he's hindered by a hamstring injury. Well, it becomes that much more difficult to, for him to run all over him. Um, so I think, I, I mean, listen, the decision that was made against USF, I think probably had to happen because they needed to conserve him for Tulane. You know, he's a, he's going to be a big, big factor against Tulane. We, again, we talked about it ad nauseum at this point. He really killed Tulane's defense. They couldn't really stop him until the second half. And, and that's going to be crucial. I mean, if, if UCF wants to get out to a big lead early or at least get, you know, some comfort early on in the game, it's going to, you know, have to be in the hands of JRP and then the legs of JRP. Um, so we'll see how much that hamstring, you know, injury hinders them. You know, Gus claimed the same thing happened against Navy, which is why we saw Mikey in the second half, you know, according to Gus. But, oh, I mean, he very well may not be at 100%, but you need him as close as you can get because he's going to be crucial in beating a two-lane team that, you know, struggles against mobile quarterbacks like this. And listen, and a hundred percent, we've given JRP fl- uh, deserved flack. I mean, listen, we're again, this show, we do not cookie cutter. We don't do that. I mean, we've stayed consistent. We've said what we thought we've said what we felt and some other shows might, you know, decide, listen, you just be positive and that's fine. I mean, but JRP has deserved the flack he's gotten, but I will say the last back half of the year, I will say a lot more steadiness out of him. There hasn't been a bunch of this. And you could say Navy, right? You could say, oh, you know, the Navy game. But I'm going to be honest. Like, wa- like when we watched the Navy game, there wasn't like a blame JRP. The one should have been a touchdown. It was a good throw. I mean, the one throw, he missed 100%. But JRP's been pretty consistent. And I think, yes, you do have Mikey. But I think the perfect example was against USF. I mean, nothing against Mikey, because I will, I love that kid, I love everything he's done for this program, but I think it just shows you, right, and the reason why Gus is so adamant on this type of quarterback is USF, it was much easier to defend us, you know, with Mikey than JRP. I mean, it just, you add a different element, and I think to beat Tulane, you need JRP to be the best version of JRP. If we have the best version of John Rice Plumley on Saturday, we are very almost impossible to beat. If we don't turn over the ball and we just run it down their throats where you don't know who's running it, whether that be a, a wide receiver, quarterback, running back, I mean, you're we're going to put up points regardless. So it should be interesting. I'm excited. What is one player, Rob, before we go on to our predictions and stuff? What is who's one player that needs? And I know we already said JRP. So I mean, JRP definitely needs to step up and and be a hundred percent and play like his best game. Who is one player? You can name offense or defense. I don't care. Who's one player that needs to step up if UCF wants a chance to win on Saturday? Yeah, and I think you mentioned his name, Jeremiah Jean Baptiste. Um, he is the leader of this defense. Um, he is. I I don't want to say he's the best player on the defense. I'd say he's probably probably the most important part of the defense. I don't know if he's the most gifted or the most um you know, most talented guy on the defense. There's a couple guys you could make an argument for, but Jeremiah Jean Baptiste is a phenomenal player and he's a leader on this team. There's a reason he's a captain on that defense. Uh he brings so much experience, 
so much leadership, so much communication to this defense. He's kind of the glue that holds it all together. Uh, you mentioned it. He didn't play against Tulane. Um, he was a clear, clear missing uh, piece when they played Tulane. So I think having Jeremiah Jean Baptiste available now, you know, this is a guy that you absolutely need. Uh, you know, Tulane has a mobile quarterback. You know, you know, Tulane has a guy that can use his feet. You know, they have a good run game or they have at least a good running back. Um, so to shut that down, you need a great linebacker like Jeremiah Jean Baptiste. So having that leader on your defense, having that guy that can step up and, and kind of calm the, the defensive unit down and kind of communicate with everybody uh, is, is, you know, unmatched. I mean, it, it says so much to have a guy like that, a leader like that on your team. So absolutely, I think if you need a big, this is the biggest game that the defense will play all year. This is their biggest test. I know they've seen this two-lane team before, but this is their biggest test all season long. And so having Jeremiah Jean Baptiste, who is your leader on defense, uh, he absolutely needs to step up and, and really just lead this defense into what has to be their arguably best defensive performance all season long. 100%. Because you went defense, I'm going to go offense. And mine is kind of, a, they go together. Um, I'm going to say the offensive line and Isaiah Bowser. Listen, we know what RJ Harvey can do. We've seen it. There are some times he doesn't really need the offensive line to be good. He just makes he just makes stuff happen, even when the line breaks down. Isaiah Bowser, listen, we've been critical this season. It, he hasn't looked the same. I think we've tried to make him a first, second, third down back, and it, he he's just not that this season. I think for us to have a chance, we need, again, I said, we need to run the ball down their throat. We had 336 rushing yards in the first game. I think you have to have a similar number this game. And I think to end that game against Tulane, you basically had Isaiah Bowser just running it down that Tulane defense every single play. And he was the reason kind of on that drive, he was the reason he scored. He did the dirty work along with the offensive line. You're going to need RJ Harvey to be RJ Harvey. No question. You're going to need him. But I think if we're going to win this game, it Isaiah Bowser has to be Isaiah Bowser from last year. And, and that's not a, we're not asking for much. We're asking, listen, you get the ball 15 carries, 80, 85 yards. 15 carries for 80, 85 yards, I think that's what gets it done. If you get that, you know, RJ Harvey gets about 80 yards and JRP runs, I think you I think you win easily. You neutralize the clock and you you win that ball game. But I think this, for all that Isaiah Bowser's done this year, and listen, he's had his moments, right? He Leading touchdown scorer on this team. I mean, let's not get it twisted. He's a great player, but the consistency has not been there rushing the football when you're on the 25-yard line of your own 25. I think to win this game, Isaiah Bowser needs to have his best game, and it can't be close. Um, that that offensive line gets included in that. I think the offensive line has played very well. Um, they've had the last two weeks, has been, you know, has been a little up and down. Um, they played great in the first half last week, realistically the entire game. There wasn't really moments, uh, where I don't think they got a sack. I'm trying to think they might've got, uh, they probably got a sack or two, but the offensive line has played well. We just need that against Tulane. I mean, they are dominant players. Um, those linebackers are legit. Um, like we saw, um, Anderson is a beast and we need to make sure that we play consistent. And Bowser has his best game. All right. Well, let's get into our predictions then. I mean, we, we've put everything out on the table, Rob. Uh, we, we've said everything that's needed to be said. I mean, you're, you're playing the same team. We've talked about everything. I mean, I, I've dreaded this part because I'm very nervous. I, I said this. It, it literally is deja vu, I feel like. Because before the first two-lane game, I said, I'm very nervous. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm, I don't know. Um... The bet online spread right now is three and a half. Tulane is favored uh, by three and a half. I'm going to let you go first. I have no idea. Give me your score prediction. Go ahead. I I, I got to think through this. Let's go 28-21. I think this is going to be a much closer game. Obviously, it was a close game last time. UCF, the, I don't think the score last time really reflected how the game went overall. The UCF could have won by a lot more. 
um, especially with what they did with the running game and with JRP. I think, as I was mentioning earlier, I think Tulane figures it out a little bit. I think regardless of who starts, Mikey Keene, if JRP is fully healthy, I expect he will be. I believe he will be our starting quarterback on Saturday. I think Tulane shuts down JRP a little bit. I think he shuts down. I think Tulane's defense shuts down the run a little bit more. Ultimately, though, I think UCF is able to win it. Um, I think, you know, I, I, like you said, I think this game is probably one in the trenches with Bowser in the offensive line. Um, and I still think JRP has a good game against them. I just don't think he's going to have quite the game that he had the last time because I think Tulane and Willie Fritz will adjust a little bit. Um, so I'm going to go 28-21. I still think it's going to be a close game, but I ultimately think UCF, listen, say what you will about UCF, ups and downs this season. One thing they've done really well is play ranked teams very well. They've beaten both Cincinnati and Tulane. They've proven in the big moments against the big teams, they can get it done. This is a big team. It's a ranked team. I think UCF gets it done, and we're looking at another conference championship. It's a tough one. It's tough. I don't know what my score prediction was for the first matchup. I'm going to be honest. Um, It might be the same but maybe this is just how I view these two teams. I will say, and I'm going to be honest, I'm 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 not I don't sugarcoat things. I could see Tulane winning this game substantially. I mean, I think Tulane it's a team like this is just so dangerous. I don't even care like UCF is the better team. I I 100% think UCF has the better players, but we've also said that all year. And again, opposing fans get mad at me and type in my comments. Keep typing. I don't care. It's true. It's on paper we are the better team. And that's it. It's not a knock on other programs. Again, that's just being honest. I mean, Tulane's a great team. And I think it's so dangerous playing a team like that and a coach that, you know, going from the bottom to the top. Again, look where UCF in 2017. You just felt like it was meant to happen. You felt like there was no way UCF was going to lose that game. And I feel like that might be Tulane this time. I mean, they're playing a team that has been at the top of the peak and top of the mountain. And I think they're going to want, you know, I think they're just, they're going to be playing, not that we're not playing for anything, but I think they're playing for respect. And I think we've gotten respect this this season, just in the rankings and all that. Now, what I will say is, yes, you are right. I mean, they did stop us on the goal line that one time. So ultimately, it should have been 45-31 if we're looking at a final score. Now, we can play the what-if game all we want, right? But, yeah, UCF should have should have scored more points. But also, I mean, Tulane turned over the ball twice, and we didn't. So, and we God knows we've had problems with turning over the ball recently. So ECU. Yeah. USF. Um, here's my thing. I like our chances, but you need to play. It's it's just like I said previously with Cincy and Tulane. When you're playing a ranked opponent, and this is when we go to the Big 12 next year, right, guys? This is going to be the same for all those matchups. It's not, you don't need some analysis that is going to blow your minds of like why, what this team needs to do. You need to play a perfect game. Don't turn the ball over. Own time of possession. Run the football down their throat. And I think you beat them easily. You did that in the first matchup and it still was close. I mean, you were up by two touchdowns in the fourth quarter, but it was it was still a close game. And you felt like Tulane, if you made one mistake, was going to make you pay. And UCF, to their credit, didn't. But you're seeing them again. I, my prediction, my American Athletic Conference championship prediction is 31 to 28 UCF. I think it's a field goal. I think it's very close. I don't think either team's going to pull away. And I think UCF ultimately makes one extra field goal. But I think it comes down, I don't even know if I want to say it. I think it comes down to a Colton Boomer field goal. I can't think take that. I don't want it either, but I think <laughs> you almost had it last week against USF and the holy holler catch happened. So you didn't have to see it, but I think it's going to come down to a field goal and I don't know where that field goal comes, but if I'm, if I'm just going to predict the game, I'm saying 
end of the game, UCF drives the ball down the field. It's a tie game. And you have to you make the true freshman go out there and win you a conference title. Do I want that to happen? Absolutely not. But we'll see. We will see. I don't know, Rob. That'll be amazing. I, I hope. It, just imagine if UCF could. We said it. We started this podcast, guys. And we said. And I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Because listen, I this is a toss-up game. We said. The whole reason my in my description when we started this show was follow al- follow us along as we recap UCF's last season in the American as they look to leave the American out on top of the championship. And they're in the game. And now you got to go win it. You got to go win it. And if you win, you go to Dallas for a Cotton Bowl appearance. And if you lose, you lose a championship and you're playing in a military bowl. Which, again, no disrespect to the Military Bowl. It's a great bowl game, but it's not the Cotton Bowl. So, and a lot more money comes along with the Cotton Bowl. I don't care who you're playing. You might get playing. I don't even want to get into it. We'll don't, cross don't that bridge. Don't get into it, please. I'm not getting into that. <laughs> that would be an interesting pot if that happened. Oh, boy. Okay, Rob, final thoughts in on this American Conference Championship show. Final thoughts... Yeah, just just your final thoughts before this game takes place in a couple days. Yeah, it's uh, it's been an interesting season. Uh, season, uh, it's had its up and downs. You know, uh, it's kind of like Forrest Gump. You know, it's like life's like a box of chocolates. UCF is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get on game day. But you know what? I do know that, like I said, UCF has done well against the ranked teams. So I have a little bit more confidence in them. I think hopefully they realize from the USF game that, hey, we probably uh, should lock things down a little bit. And I think they do take Tulane a little bit more seriously. And I think they realize, you know, especially Gus, you know, being a veteran coach realizes what's at stake. So I think there should be some confidence heading into this weekend. It's not all doom and gloom. Oh, my God, Tulane. They're going to, you know, what are they going to do to us after that USF loss or that USF win? I should say it felt like a loss. Um, But, you know. Ultimately, this UCF t- team is talented, and hopefully, like Nick always says, hopefully that talent does win out, and hopefully we're seeing UCF with another trophy in the cabinet because that would be a great way to send off uh, the American this season. It would be amazing. I mean, for the season that we've had, it would be a perfect way, regardless of the bowl game, regardless of the bowl game, to to leave the American on top, I think would just be the perfect cherry on top. Guys, I know you're pumped. I know you're excited. I am so pumped. Um, I'll be. We. I am going to New York. I will be in New York for the game. So I will be watching it in New York City. Nick, he's going to be watching it. I know Rob's watching it. And for all of you that are going to the game, please stay safe. Please ch- cheer as loud as humanly possible for us, uh, because. Our, our guys are going to need it. And the nice thing is the band is going. I'm so happy the band is going because that was huge in Tampa. Um, I'm nervous, but I'm so excited. It's just great to be in another American championship. I mean, it's been a couple years since he... Th- I think the one thing we can all agree on is since he has no shot at a three-peat. So that's that's great. Um, sorry, Cincy fans. Uh, actually, I'm not sorry. That's that's the Sean special right there. Um, all right, guys. Saturday, you got two more days. UCF, Tulane, Yeoman Stadium, 4 p.m. ES or ABC, ABC, and you win. And I mean, you go out on top. That's all we can ask for. You'll be getting all your coverage on Mon- uh, on Monday. Uh, we will have that episode up. I mean, we will do our best to record it. As, uh, you know, I'll be in New York again. We're going to be all in different places, three different states, but we will get it. Um, we'll get it up for you guys and record in some form or fashion. And also, guys, big stuff coming up. You know, regardless of the championship game, you've got transfer portal opening. Some guys that I think UCF is is going after heavy. Uh, You've got National Signing Day at the end of the month. Then we also, whatever bowl game we're going to be in, you're getting all the coverage here at Charge On. So please like, comment, uh, subscribe, share, uh, follow, uh, 
everything. Everything there is to do with Charge On, please do it. We really appreciate all the support. You guys have been amazing all year long. Don't stop now. We're going to be here every week for you after the game, everything. So thank you as always. And let's go get a damn American championship. Let's go get a damn championship, huh? Let's do it. Go Knights. Charge On. This has been Charge On presented by Bet Online. We will see you with the win. The win in this game on Monday.